the most disturbing elements of the Prohibition War is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows the futility of Prohibition and reaches out to educate the community and current law enforcement. Today, the Russ Belleville Show visits with another speaker from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition with one clear message. Cops say legalize drugs. Welcome back, everybody. 30 after the hour, and we're joined by Jack Cole, the co-founder and chair of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. It's our honor to have you on. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Russ. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, people know you from your work with Leap. Of course, there's that. Uh, there's all the uh, great videos that are coming out from Leap as well. Uh, the question that got asked of President Obama that uh, made such a splash in the news. What is the latest with Leap, and how are we moving forward now that we've got two states that have legalized marijuana? Well, the latest is that we're moving ahead very, very rapidly. Uh, we're sending five of our directors to Europe, to Vienna, they'll leave uh, Saturday to attend, uh, this will be the fifth time we've, we're attending the United Nations uh, Annual Conference on Narcotic Drugs. And uh, so, so we're doing this not just in the United States, but we're doing it internationally. You know, we have over 100,000 members now, police, judges, prosecutors, prison wardens, supporters in 120 countries hmm. and we have people people who have joined leap that we didn't even ever think would join leap for instance we have on our advisory board four former drug czars of their countries including the former drug czar of the european union wow that is fantastic i'm glad you bring up the uh trip to the uh to vienna and and the the U.N. has been in the news lately, uh, specifically them, the U.N. calling out the United States for uh, not cracking down on Washington and Colorado following legalization, saying that, you know, the United States needs its territories to abide by these international drug treaties. What can we do about that, about these treaties, and how is that playing in the international community? Well, we think we think uh, we can do this very well, and there there is a actually a back out clause on what's it's called the 1961 Single Convention Against Dangerous Drugs. The United States were the people that instigated that law, and we are the people that drive the drug policy laws around the world. But that's why our people are going to Vienna, uh, and we're going to try to. Uh, talk to them about the fact that uh, that uh, this should be up to each individual nation state and each state in the United States of how they want to deal with drug policy. It shouldn't be up to the United Nations. And as, and as far as international drug policy, we've seen some remarkable results with the uh, decade-long decriminalization in Portugal, and we are se we're seeing calls in the U.K. now to, re uh, again, downgrade cannabis to a Class C drug there. So uh, looking at this in comparatively, is the rest of the world ahead of us as far as moving forward on drug policy, and can they drag the United States with them? Well, I think much of the, the rest of the world is ahead of us, and... That's why we do so much work in other countries. LEAP now has uh, branch offices in a number of countries, and there's a, another dozen that want us to have offices there. Right now we have them in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Costa Rica, the Czech Republic, Poland, and the United Kingdom. Hmm. And uh, a month ago we started, no, two months ago, we started uh, LEAP Europe which is an umbrella organization that will help us start leap branches in every one of the European countries. Man, that's fantastic, the, the reach and, and, of course, the gravitas that LEAP brings to this kind of uh, anti-drug war message. You guys are on the front lines. You've seen the failures of this four-decade-long war on drugs. Again, folks, we're speaking with Jack Cole, the co-founder and chair of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And internationally, but in our hemisphere, I'd like to talk a little bit about Mexico and whether or not you're making any inroads with law enforcers there and uh, being able to do any order, any sort of thing to help, you know, that terrible, terrible devastation of that country from the drug war. Yeah, terrible is, is right. You know, the, well, well uh, 
Felipe Calderon was president, we were hearing bad things about how many people were dying, and they, they estimated 65,000 uh, drug prohibition murders in the six years of his office. But now that he's out of office, they know that it's at least 95,000 people who have been murdered down there as a result of drug prohibition, and it may go as high as 120,000 in that six-year period. Now, that's the kind of stats, stats that you get from real wars, you know, not not a drug war. This is a terrible thing that's going on. But there are 12 Latin American countries that have already come, come out calling for an end to the war on drugs, treat drug abuse as a health problem. There's seven former presidents of countries that have called for that, including Russ, there are two former presidents of the United States who are now calling to end the war on drugs, treat drug abuse as a health problem. Jimmy Carter, and he was joined by uh, Bill Clinton a few months ago when Clinton spoke at the uh, International AIDS Conference in Washington, D.C. It's remarkable. Uh, Jack, I'm wondering, uh, from those Latin American countries and from Mexico, are you getting membership and speakers joining LEAP, or is it just too dangerous for them to do that? Mexico is is very dangerous. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's, I mean, <laughs> places... Uh, Things like in the United States, it's dangerous for uh, maybe a working cop to join LEAP in a way because uh, we've actually had three uh, working cops fired after they joined LEAP. Hmm. Uh, they, there's only one of the cases that's actually been uh, heard and, and decided by the court and in that case, uh, they gave the the person that was fired all these back wages. It reinstated him at uh, full pay and at full rank, plus gave him $815,000 as a penalty payment. And and when when that was done, his chief of police says, I don't care what you say, we don't want him back. So the court said, well, that's okay. You don't have to have him back, but you have to pay him for the next 20 years and then give him his full retirement. <laughs> so uh, uh, if we get a few more findings like that, I'm sure uh, things work out pretty good for our police officers yeah, that they, are joining LEAP. Yeah, they, they, should be, they should be able to do this. Uh, they should be yeah, able to but, speak out. But that's nothing compared to what's going on in Mexico, of course. In, in Mexico, if you join something like this, you could end up dead. Yeah, certainly. So uh, it's very hard for us to come up with uh, uh, speakers down there. So far, we don't have a single speaker in Mexico. Okay. That's the only country that we've been trying to get into that, that we don't have a single speaker. Yeah, understandable. Uh, you know, another angle on this uh, fight is bringing in more voices to the table. And, of course, LEAP was one of the first groups to bring in the law enforcement voices. Now we're starting to hear voices in civil rights. And I understand uh, Ms. Alice Huffman from the California NAACP is uh, strongly involved with LEAP. Could you tell us a little bit about that and that outreach Absolutely. to the african Absolutely. She's on community? our board of directors yes. for our, our nation, international board of directors. And uh, I, I was so happy to have her come in. As a matter of fact, we had to change our bylaws to uh, allow her to come in because before that, to be a speaker, you know, as you, you know well, anybody can join Lee, but to be a speaker or a board member, you had to be a current or former law enforcer. So we changed our bylaws just to allow her to come in. She's such a dynamic person and, and uh, has such great ideas. And and we are seeing now that uh, that what I've seen all along is the all this is based really on racism. And if you go back and you study how any of these laws came about uh, on drug policy, every one of them was based on racism. Even even alcohol prohibition, either racism or, or gender, or not gender, uh, or eth ethnicity, bias of uh, someone's ethnicity. The One of the largest supporters of alcohol prohibition was the Ku Klux Klan. Hmm. Wow. Uh, 
I wanted to get into a topic, and this is a little maybe in left field, but my listeners know that usually whenever there's a big story in the news, I find some way to tie it to the drug war, to prohibition in some way. And I can understand if you don't want to touch us with a 10-foot pole, but I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, A few weeks ago, we had that terrible case of Christopher Dorner, the former LAPD, who went on his rampage and alleged all sorts of misgivings and misdoings in the uh, LAPD, racism uh, afoot. And I'm just wondering how it just seems to me that this is exacerbated. I'm not going to say it's caused, but exacerbated by this warfare militarization mentality that's been built up over the war on drugs. And I just wanted... If you had any thoughts on that you wanted to share, well, I think violence everywhere is is uh, growing because of exactly what you said the mentality this 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 attitude of uh, that this is the only way to do this uh, you, you know what look what they've done in the first place they created a war on drugs now a war is a terrible metaphor to use for policing in a democratic society when you when you create uh, this war mentality you've got to have an enemy and the enemy becomes everybody but but us everybody but the cops and uh, also when you when you create a, a war metaphor in a war the point is to win the war any means are justified by the end of winning the war. And I absolutely think that is one of the main things that drives this tremendous amount of corruption we get in police officers when it comes to enforcing or not enforcing uh, the prohibition laws. You know, at LEAP, we call those laws, uh, we we say they're... Uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback from the phone, so it's a little distracting. Sorry about that. Sorry. Uh, uh, We we refer to those laws as uh, consensual crimes. Perhaps there, we don't call them victimless crimes. Perhaps there is somebody that that, uh, is a victim in this thing, but they are all consensual crimes. Both the, the person selling the drugs and the person using the drugs get something out of this. And it's when you assign police officers to enforce laws against consensual crimes that you always get this tremendous amount of corruption. And that's when you get uh, police officers uh, stomping on people's civil rights and and, uh, uh, violating the Fourth Amendment and lying on the stand. Uh, it, It becomes a numbers game. And it's been going on for 42 years, and the police know what a, what a useless thing this is. They know that we have, for instance, 23 times as many people using drugs today as we had when we started the war. Uh, we, we, when they started the war, <laughs> we, we used to seize uh, – the, our largest seizures, they were measured in pounds. Today, our largest seizures are measured in tons. That's 2,000 times worse problem. Uh, when I started buying heroin on the streets, uh, it was coming, street-level heroin was coming in. One and a half percent of that powder that I would buy was actually heroin. One and a half percent. Today, DEA tells us 60 percent of, of this powder that's sold as street-level heroin is actually heroin. That's a problem 40 times greater than it was at the beginning of the war. So all these things indicate total failure. And and the police know that. <clears throat> so say, say you're, a, you're a young cop out there, you've been fighting this war for five or ten years, and uh, uh, you go into some house where... You just hit a place uh, that's a drug den, and and there there on the bed is a suitcase with three or four hundred thousand dollars of uncounted money in it, and uh, you're assigned to just watch the money until other police can take care of things and come in and, and then count the money, and maybe in your back pocket you got a you know a bill from the plumber for a couple thousand dollars and. 
and you think, well, none of this really matters anyway. So you take a taste, and then you're then you're gone. You know, after you, after you do that, that's that's the way this corruption starts. Yeah, it's just a, yet another way it infects our society. It, it, it makes the police worse. It makes the citizens worse. It makes our world worse. And we thank you so much for all the work that Leap is doing to try to help end this. Want to give everyone a chance to get in touch with Leap. The uh, website is leap.cc or copsaylegalizeddrugs.com. And we've been speaking with Jack Cole, who is the co-founder and chair of Leap. And before we let you go, any last words? Well, I, I would just, my last words would be, please, everybody come and join us. If we're going to change these laws, we have to create a huge grassroots organization to come out against them. But it can't just be a grassroots organization. It has to be a credible grassroots organization. And we don't think anybody is more credible than than the folks at LEAP. So... If we got to a million, two million people in our organization, we'll be able to go down to Washington and force these legislators to change these laws. Oh, Jack Cole, thank you so much for joining us here on the Russ Belville Show. We'll talk to you again sometime. Bye. When we come back, time for a radical rant. We'll look at that racism in the drug war when we come back. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420-friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes...